to their futures. Soldiers speak out. One part of the anti-war anti movement was veteran and GI resistance, which has been minimized and the story hasn't been well told. Uh, we have two, uh, two members from that uh, who are here. We have Bob Barnes and Randy Nolan, if you guys can come up. By way of introduction, um, Bob Barnes joined the Army in 1968 and realized on the first day of basic training at Fort Polk, Louisiana, that he had made a huge mistake. <laughs> After completing advanced military training, he dropped out of officer candidate school and applied for discharge of the conscientious objective. He spent the remaining two years of active duty organizing GIs to oppose the war and has been involved in anti-war and justice uh, environmental movements ever since. Randy Rowland is a retired registered nurse who in the 1960s was an army medic who broke with the U.S. war against Vietnam after tending to gravely injured soldiers at Madigan General Hospital in Fort Lewis. Convicted of mutiny stemming from a sit-down protest at the Presidio Stockade in 1968, he spent one and a half years in prison. After his release from Leavenworth and discharge from the Army, he returned to organize GIs at Fort Lewis for the GI Alliance, including helping establish the Fort Lewis McCord Free Press, the GI anti-war underground newspaper in the early 1970s. In the 1980s, he was founder and editor of Storm Warning, a radical veterans zine, and working with the Independent Media Center during the 1999 WTO protest in Seattle, he founded the activist video collective Pepper Spray Productions, which for many years produced the weekly TV show India Media Presents. Please help me welcome Dr. Bob Bards and Randy Knoll. You pretty much covered it. Any questions? <laughs> uh, so this, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm really sorry we missed the earlier part of this because there would have been some really good context that would have probably triggered, at least for me, some memories that somebody's had some 50 years since the start of the war. It hasn't really been that long. Uh, back in the late 60s, I was growing up in East Texas, and I was, uh, I was not too enlightened. I was kind of against the war because it just seemed like a dumb thing, and I would ask people, why are we there? And it's yeah. like, well, we're just, we're fighting the communists. Well, what does that mean? You know, I, unbeknownst to me, I think I was one of them before I even knew I was. So it just, that didn't make sense. Uh, but I was also a product of our society and uh, didn't, I was about to graduate from college, didn't really want to go to grad school just to get out of going into the service because I didn't want to go to grad school. No offense, anybody who's in grad school. I did go back to grad school after I was out. Um, so I joined the Army um, as an officer because my friendly recruiter told me I could be in the uh, adjutant general's corps. And I'd go to embassy parties in Washington, D.C. for four years, and that sounded like fun. Um, that was obviously a lie. Um, so I get down to, and I was so dumb. I mean, this was after TAP. Y'all probably talked about TAP, you know. I mean, that was a big deal. I didn't know what the hell TAP was or what the implications safety were. Safety words. Safety words. Safety words. Uh, okay, so y'all didn't cover, well, I, you'll have to help me, because it was basically when the Vietnamese first let the world know that they were running things. They kicked our butts, you know. I mean, I don't know how much more I want to say. That's sort of, it's not a sidelight, but it was an important turning point um, in the war. Um, 1968. 68, yeah, the 68 was earlier in the year. Pepper Spray. Pepper Spray. Yeah, yeah, I, jo I joined in the fall of 68 so I mean this was it was news but it was not news to me so so I get into Fort Lou, Fort Pope Louisiana and the first thing I noticed was I'm in a wow. barracks full speak of up. Huh? speak up people oh I'm sorry yeah oh, can you hear me now Thank you. okay mic check <laughs> we won't do that uh, <laughs> um, I was yeah, three or four years older and a lot wider than most of the people I was in basic training with. And as I got to talking to folks and, and heard their stories, most of them didn't join. Uh, the ones that joined, most of them, had been given choice. You can join the army or you can go to jail. And, yeah, 
choice. That was not a good choice, you know. Uh, there were also, uh, most of the kids were, were drafted. Uh, the vast majority of the folks I was with were, were African American, uh, Chicanos, uh, the, uh, you know, not an insignificant number of white folks, and a number of the white folks were, had joined and were going to be uh, going into some specialty field or becoming officers, you know. Um, and I, I realized earlier on that just, you know, even if I did this four years of embassy parties, this was part of a system that I didn't want to have anything to do with. But I was in the army now, so what the hell? Um, and in shock, because uh, any y'all, some of y'all have been in the army. I mean, it's pretty, yeah, the, the, the purpose of the first three or four months is to beat beat you down, you know, to make you a good soldier, which means, you know, I'm going to lose all my humanity, I'm going to follow orders, I'm going to do what you tell me to, and that means killing people, you know. Um, so I had to overcome that. Uh, um, circumstances right when we were, I'm going to try and abbreviate this story because it's kind of an interesting story. We were about to graduate from advanced infantry training uh, right before Christmas. Uh, there was two weeks left of our training. They shut, pretty much shut the training base down, sent people home for a week for the holidays, uh, assuring us that after our final two weeks, when we graduated, those who were going to be going to Vietnam right away would be allowed to go back home, say goodbye to their friends and family and their loved ones, and then take their next set of orders. When we got back from the holidays, the uh, our, our commander said, you know what, things are kind of in a situation now where we can't spare you, we're going to have to ship you right over. Uh, you know, this is hundreds, thousands of people who had come back from leave not having said their perhaps final goodbyes to their families and loved ones, and were a little freaked out, collective freak out. So I, um, I'd been in touch with this group, the SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, Peter or somebody may have mentioned them, uh, for other circumstances. Uh, I had a phone number of a guy down in Austin. I called him, I said, Larry, what the fuck? Uh, we got a situation here. It wasn't going to affect me. I was going on to officer candidate school. We got these hundreds of guys who were about to get shipped off. They didn't get a chance to say goodbye to their friends and family. Got any thoughts? Um, well, he wanted to do a whole education packet, but he also told me about conscientious objection. Um, he sent me some information about why we were in Vietnam. Uh, communism didn't come up. Oil came up. Tungsten came up. Uh, you know. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the real reason, you know. It's re it was a resource war back then, just like our wars now are, are resource wars, but it, wasn't, it was less publicly known back then. Um, so uh, the plan ended up being, they really want these guys over in Vietnam. If they go AWOL for a week and they check in down at their overseas replacement station, either out here at Fort Polk or Fort Lewis or um, in Oakland, they'll probably not say anything but welcome back, here's your M16, now get on the plane. Hundreds of GIs took off the night after graduation and went home. Now, I don't know about all of them because I wasn't in touch with all of them, but the ones I was in touch with checked in a couple weeks later to their overseas replacement station. Not a word about court martial or, you know, boy, that was really bad what you did. Just, here's your M16, here's your plane, head on over. But that was a powerful lesson for uh, resistance, for collective action. Um, and, okay, so I'll just leave that hanging out. And I need to watch my time here because Randy needs to have a chance to talk. Um, how did I resist? I'm going by our stock questions here. Well, after I dropped out of OCS, I dropped into the kitchen and did a lot of KP. Uh, there hadn't been many people file as COs uh, at Fort Polk since World War II. They didn't know how to deal with it. Um, and I 
got to hang out around the base and talk to a lot of guys and found out that there were a lot of other folks that had a, you know, didn't didn't want to go or had gone and were fucked up by it and knew it was an issue, uh, wanted to do something. Um, there was a, there were, an, you know, I'd say probably hundreds, probably thousands that we did, I don't know about throughout throughout the country, um, who were vocally anti-war. We in nineteen, you're going to have to help me out. When was the when was the New York Times? Uh, it was sixty nine, I think. Moratorium Day. Sixty nine. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was a New York Times full page <laughs> ad that fifteen hundred GIs signed. Uh, that uh, active duty GIs and we are opposed to this war. Um, I helped circulate that around Fort Polk and we got a few of those 1500 signatures um, on that. So there was really visible opposition to the war. Uh, I also discovered other folks who were actively opposing the war and saying, hell no, I'm not going. Um, when my Second application for discharge as a conscientious objector came back, denied because I did not truly hold the beliefs which I professed. They gave me a free airplane ride out here to Fort Lewis, um, where I turned in my third application and was put in a barracks full of about 20 or 30 other conscientious objectors who would come in from various parts of the country. Grateful too. <laughs> put us in this barracks with nothing to do but hang out. I think it was the second night we were going off base, hooking up with the with the movement in Tacoma. Uh, there was a pretty vibrant anti-war movement uh, in, all over but in Tacoma. There were a couple GI coffee houses. Um, of that crew, um, in the spring of 70, it had winnowed down to where uh, six folks refused orders to Vietnam. They're called the Fort Lewis Six. There's a little local lore about them. Um, I think I probably would have been the seventh, but I had not enough time left in the service to get shipped anywhere. So I stuck around and, and helped with their case. They were ultimately uh, found guilty of refusing orders. Uh, two of them spent two years in Leavenworth. The rest of them spent a year in Leavenworth uh, for refusing those orders. Um, so, you know, I'm going to kind of, I'm not even sure where there's a wrap up here. Uh, um, I first met Randy in 1970, 71. We were both out of the Army then. He was doing uh, GI organizing in some hippie radical household in Tacoma. I was fresh out of the Army and wanting to become one of them anti-war hippies. Um, and Randy, reel it back. Okay. So, <laughs> they told us that if we didn't stop them over there, we'd have to stop them over here. Mm -hmm. Of course, the GIs got over to Vietnam and found out that Vietnam didn't have a Navy. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was one of those guys that I joined the Army in 1967. And February of 1967, believing it was my patriotic duty that a guy ought to pay back to the country, you know, for, for the privilege of living here. And I, I still believe that, actually. I just have redefined who I think my debt is owed to, and I figure that now I fight for the cause of humanity <laughs> rather than for, you know, an oil baron or some asshole up in Washington, D.C. In 1968, October of 1968, I was sent into the Presidio Stockade by the GI movement to organize GIs because a guard had been had shotgunned and killed one of the prisoners there. It, there this, in those days, the Presidio of San Francisco was a military base. It was the headquarters for the 6th Army, which is right. the west coast of the United States. So I went in on a Saturday. I kind of had to wiggle my way into, into the stockade by refusing to do something nobody would asked me to do. <laughs> and um, and um, on Monday, we sat down and we sang We Shall Overcome. I was convicted of mutiny for singing We Shall Overcome. And um, the first sentences were 14 and 16 years. I was one of the ringleaders, and those guys that got the 14 and the 16 years were the guys we thought were going to get off easy. Well, a year and a half later, I did find myself 
walking out of Leavenworth because at a certain point they decided to let all of us go because the political price that they had paid it was kind of like the old saying about they picked up a rock only to drop it on their own feet. Um, I'm going to keep my particular story short because I want to close a feedback loop that Bob hasn't heard this yet. Bob is one of those guys that signed that, he was one of the 1500 that signed that, uh, that full page ad. My, I'm going to say this about how, what motivated me to become a GI resistor. I was a medic and I was stationed at Fort Lewis and I was taking care, I was, I, I, I'm a retired nurse now and I spent my nursing career at Harborview up in Seattle working on a, in the trauma center on with a head and neck injured people. And I was doing very similar kind of work actually um, as, a, as a medic at Fort Lewis. I was taking care of guys who had been wounded in, in battle in Vietnam. And um, they didn't go away. That's not the kind of patient that uh, goes away very quick because they're paralyzed from some point down or brain dead. And we used them as training exercises for the young doctors or whatever. And the, the, their, the horror of their circumstance, you know, 18-year-old guy, his 17-year-old girlfriend comes in, sees him one time, never comes back, you know, and I'm the guy taking care of him, digging the shit out of his ass, you know, and um, trying to keep him alive. And, um, and it was a pretty horrific circumstance. And so I was, of course, moved by that. But at the same time, I was challenged because every one of those guys that I was taking care of told me that they had not made their sacrifice for a good cause. None of them were proud of the fact that they had been wounded for the cause of America. And what they were talking about instead was how they had been fucking over the Vietnamese so badly. And they actually felt guilty, you know. And so the combination of the horror that they were experiencing you know, and the uh, the horror that they had experienced, and that you know that kind of made me think, well, gosh, I ought to try and figure out what's going on here because this ain't what I thought it was going to be. You know, I mean, I was raised in a conservative family, and, you know, God in America and all that stuff. At any rate, so I decided to look into it. And of course, as soon as I started looking into it, I figured out quick enough that the war was wrong, and so then I started organizing against it as one of the activists within the military. There were other people who were actually sent in by radical organizations to organize GIs. I have a couple of friends, one that lives up in Federal Way right now, and uh, one that lives over here on Anderson Island. Both of them went into the into the, uh, military with the express purpose of organizing GIs to be against the war. That's pretty impressive. But that happened actually later, mostly. You know, this was this was 1967 and 1968, and it was just starting to ramp up. So at any rate, I was one of the Presidio 27. Convicted of mutiny, it's the most serious military crime. Not only are you going up against the brass, but you're doing it in concert with others. And of course, that's what really freaks them out. It's when one guy says, no, it's you know easy enough to deal with it. But when you start organizing, you know, boy, howdy. So at any rate, uh, uh, who here, if, if you're interested in, I'm going to cut to the to my feedback loop in about a second here. But uh, first, I'm going to do just a, if you're interested in, the history of GI resistance to the Vietnam War, then if you haven't seen this movie called Sir No Sir. We showed it last Friday here. Did you? All right. Good. Well, if you saw that movie, you probably saw me in it. One of the, my first act of resistance was very small. One of my, uh, my uh, barracks mates uh, at Fort Lewis was from New York, and he had uh, a subscription to the Village Voice, which in those days was more of an alternative paper than you might think of it as today. Um, but uh, and um, and there was an ad in the Village Voice by some group that was called Individuals Against the Crimes of Silence, and the concept was that if you see something bad happening and you don't do anything about it, then you're guilty too, and so you've got to take a stand and break with with the bad thing, right? And um, and so what you're supposed to do is sign the piece of paper that say I'm against, I'm not going to be, you know, commit the crime of silence. I'm, and so you know I. He was in the next bunk, and he's my friend, and he used to get it, and he would always give it to me when I was when he was done reading it, and I'd read the Village Voice. I was kind of a bunk, and I didn't know shit. And the New York, you know, the Village Voice was like, ooh, boy, this is like, yeah. But at any rate, so I saw that thing, so I clipped out the ad and signed my name and sent it in, and pretty soon, you know, and sometime later, I got in a mail um, at the hospital there at, at, at Madigan, um, uh, the medics would eat in the cafeteria, and our mailboxes were right there by the cafeteria, you know, and uh, kind of like a post office style. Unlike a lot of the military experience, we actually, you know, you'd go to the post office and open your little box, and there'd be your letter from mom. 
Well, anyway, and there was a little envelope, and in it was a packet from the Individuals Against Crimes of Silence. And so I went and got my tray and sat down at my table, and all my buddies were there, you know, and we're talking about, you know, what the patients were doing today or whatever, you know, who knows what. And I opened up my thing, and damn, it was all those little flyers about, you know, for people to sign the, the statement. So I said, wow, this is cool. So I passed them down to my buddies, and, you know, and the next thing I knew, of course, I was standing at attention in front of the uh, yeah. commander's desk because I had distributed literature on base in uniform on, while on duty. And I, I, you know, I mean, I was, I didn't, I didn't, first of all, I didn't know you couldn't do that. I thought it was America, you know. But, yeah. but second of all, it was like, hello. I mean, I just opened up the package and passed it down. You know, I was like, hello. You know, I mean, and, and he said, those people are communists, you know. <laughs> and I, I was really naive, but at the same time, I just didn't feel like I was going to get bullshitted by him. And um, I wasn't that dumb, I guess. I said, well, if they're communists, I'm not for them, but, you know, I don't think they are. And, and so until then, I'm, you know, you know, I'm sticking with them or whatever, you know, something. At any rate, I lost a stripe over that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was, but that was the step, you know, and one step leads to another step. And the next thing you know, I, I was refusing to sweep a floor that nobody asked me to sweep. And, going into the stockade so I could organize a sit-down, which in fact happened, and caused a big ruckus. Now I'm going to get to what I'm going to do next, which is, you just heard that, so I guess the point to that is that you think, oh, signing those little petitions or having those ads, you know, it's not nearly as, as, as exciting as blowing up a recruiting station. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not putting neither of those down, frankly. Uh, you know, I think that a movement requires a variety of things. But almost always people take a little baby step before they ever take the big step, you know. And I took a baby step by signing my little thing. Bob took a step by signing that petition. And here is the result. Now, I'm going to tell you that I was the senior medic. You know, I was a, in those days I wasn't yet a registered nurse. I was a licensed practical nurse when I went to Leavenworth, and so I worked in the prison clinic. I even put that on my resume. And everybody just assumed that because I'm a, I was a male nurse that I was probably on staff at Leavenworth, and actually I was a prisoner. But uh, I would have answered honestly if anybody ever asked me, but they never did. So, so uh, nowadays, I suppose with the internet, it'd be harder to pull that stunt off, but I did it. But at any rate, the, the point here is that uh, my greatest regret from that period, five days a week, Monday through Friday, we'd get the new prisoners into the penitentiary. And one of the part of the processing into the penitentiary was that they would come over to the to the clinic and um, um, and and uh, I would have them sit down in little school desks, you know, and these big belunkuses in these little school desks, but they'd fill out a health care questionnaire. I'd draw some blood, I'd take a chest x-ray to make sure they didn't have TB. And uh, and then I'd shepherd them down the hall where the uh, the doctor would uh, give them a little physical exam. And I, the guards would drop off the day's group, uh, and then the guards would go away. And so I'd have these guys, and, and, and I had lots of time. And so every day I'd say, are there any political prisoners today? <laughs> and every day, at least one guy would raise their hand, sometimes several. And then I had lots of time, so I'd say, well, tell us your story. So five days a week, I heard the stories of the finest of Americas who had stood up and had done some act of resistance that had ended up with them being in jail. Some of them had killed their company commanders. Some of them had done all kinds of resistances, every kind of resistance you can imagine. You know, um, um, you know, they had published underground papers. They had done whatever. And five days a week, I heard their stories as part of their intake in the Leavenworth Penitentiary. Sadly, I didn't write any of it down. And it was years later when I realized that I had made a terrible error by not documenting that because it was America's finest and it was the bravest and the boldest and the baddest of them and I had gotten the great honor of hearing their stories and getting to know them and I didn't write a word of it down and there was no way that I could remember it well enough to ever write the book that should have been written about that. But I learned my lesson. So in the 80s, now this is uh, February 1990, this is Storm Warning, which was a radical veterans zine. Uh, that I was the editor of and at a certain point I learned my lesson and I started getting oral histories. So this is a history of a guy named Dave Blaylock. I'm going to read it to you because it personifies, it, it tells the story of some resistance that happened in country and that will close a feedback loop that Bob Barnes has yet to hear. So 
I just thought that this would be kind of a fun way. It's kind of like Queen for a Day or something. He, he helped get those signatures on that thing. You're going to hear about it now. In August 69, we got some new, I'm just going to read this whole thing. It's just a couple, it's a couple pages in a zine, so it's not going to bore you. In August 69, we got some new guys in the security platoon, burnouts from the first CAV. I think they were supposed to be on easy duty for a while to try to get themselves back together. I remember one day we went out on patrol. We told them, just take it easy, tag along. We're just going into the ville to pick up some stuff. As we were leaving the ville, we hear these burnouts open up. In other words, they start shooting. They blew away a bunch of people, a couple of kids. We all ran back there, and immediately a big debate broke out among the other guys. Some thought we ought to kill these assholes right on the spot for what they had done. Maybe we should have, because after that we started getting hit by the VC. That's the vehicle. But before we could decide, the commander caught a chopper out into the field. He was so happy to finally be getting body count. There were six or seven civilians who were killed, but in the report that went from battalion to brigade level, they doubled the numbers. It must have kept getting pumped up all the way up the chain of command, because by the time the incident was reported in my hometown newspaper, which I got in the mail, the count was 200 BC killed. Our side had broken the unofficial truce. One of the acts of resistance by many GIs was was they would carry their weapon a certain way, and they would, you know, we won't shoot you if you don't shoot us. And it was kind of mutual survival, which, of course, greatly benefited the, the, uh, uh, the Vietnamese fighters. Um, our side had broken the unofficial truce, and now we started getting hit. The guys wanted to, to get back to search and avoid, as opposed to search and destroy. Unfortunately, the brass from the comfort of their desk had a scent of blood. Our company commander started putting a lot of pressure on us to get some body count. We started getting harassed about our hair. The black guys were getting harassed about their black par symbols and their afros, and generally life was getting miserable. After putting up with an awful lot of this constant harassment, the GIs had this big gathering in the bunkers one night. The debate was over whether to frag the company commander, frag is to kill him. The brothers were mainly the ones who wanted to waste him. We all hated him, but some people thought, but some people didn't think we ought to kill him. To settle the thing, somebody put forward that maybe we should unite around giving him one more chance, just a little warning. And everyone generally agreed. Somebody left a grenade on the CO's bunk with a note tied to it. Quit fucking with us. <laughs> the CO flipped out and intensified all the shit he was bringing down on us. So about two weeks later, there was another meeting of the GIs in the bunkers. There was even more sentiment to waste the CO, but one guy had worked in a union shop before the service, and he says, look, we'll give him a final warning. So that's what happened. This time the pin was pulled part way out of the grenade. You give a guy a chance, you bend over backwards, show some good faith, and try to be reasonable. But instead of getting the clue, the CO heaped it on with everybody with even more, more intensified harassment and bullshit. The CO must have thought that the warnings were coming from the security platoon. The guy who was writing this was in the security platoon. Because all of a sudden, there were all these new guys in our platoon, obviously military intelligence. But, they were, but we were just a small platoon in the whole place, and we were being really cool because we weren't the ones anyway. About a week later, the CO opened the door to his hooch, and a charge went off and blew him away. For a while after that, everybody was nice to us. Everybody was friendly. It was like a fresh breeze blowing through the air. None of us ever figured out who fragged the CO. The next CO they brought in was a lot slicker than the old one. Everything was going pretty well, but then a guy in our platoon went to Hawaii for R&R, &R, and he met his girlfriend there. And when he came back, we were hanging out in the bunkers partying. He walks in and pulls out a full-page ad from the New York Times signed by 1,500 active-duty GIs announcing the war and supporting a big moratorium, that's the one that Bob signed, <clears throat> and supporting the big moratorium demonstration that was going to happen. The talk started going around and we all thought it was, a, it was pretty neat. We started talking about what could we do here to add to the anti-war protest. Finally, we decided to use our boot strings as black armbands. And on a certain day, we would wear them and refuse to go on patrol. Then one sergeant said, let's shut the whole base down. Let's not just keep this in our own unit. We knew guys in the first cab and in the engineers and pretty much all over the base. We spread the word around to the other units. And when the day happened, it was 100% in my company. The CO was pretty slick, though. So rather than make a big deal out of it, when he saw all the black armbands, he said, hey, you guys have been working pretty hard. And I'm going to give you guys a break today. You don't have to go on patrol. Take a day off. We jumped into a vehicle and drove around to the other units to see how it was going with them. It was pretty widespread in the other units, too. The guys in the first air cab were pretty much 100%. Even some of the warrant officers, that's the helicopter pilots, were wearing the black armbands. 
but it had only been partially successful over at the engineers. As we drove up, their CO was standing out front of the formation with his pistol out, holding it up to the one guy's head, saying that he was going to give the guy a summary court martial right on the spot if anybody didn't go to work that day. The CO said he would charge the guy with mutiny and shoot him on the spot. Page 22. We could only see we could see that only part of the formation was wearing the armbands, and it looked like the CO was scared scaring everybody pretty bad. We were pretty bummed out, but then the formation was dismissed and one guy came over to us and said slyly, don't worry, nobody around here will work for weeks. We fucked up all the bulldozers. <laughs> <laughs> but probably the wildest thing that happened that day was the MPs. There was a small MP detachment as military police. <clears throat> they ran the sound system on base. We didn't even think of going to them. We figured, oh, they're MPs, but they got wind of the thing somehow and that morning, Instead of playing Reveille over the loudspeakers, they played Jimi Hendrix's Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> That's how we woke up, all over the base that morning. When I got back to the war, I still had a year and a half left before discharge. What I had to show for being in Vietnam was a piece of shrapnel that cut me right above my eye, messed up my knees from when a guy landed on them backwards during a mortar attack, and a new and strong understanding of the ugly face of America. And he goes on to talk about being a GI resistor in the United States. So the point is, this is a first-hand account of an experience from a Vietnam GI who saw the thing that Bob signed and helped circulate and get signed that had been in the New York Times and just by happenstance was able to then bring that back to his base. And as a result, here was one of the many incidences. There is, between, the, the Army admits this part, between 1968 in 1972, 68, 69, 70, 71, 71, those four years, 68 through 71, there were 1,100 fraggings. That's 1,100 names put on that wailing wall in Washington, D.C. by the hands of their own troops. 1,100. So when you wonder about whether the GI movement might have had any kind of influence on the end of the war, not to detract from the incredible stamina uh, uh, and heroism of the Vietnamese people who continued to fight. There's an old saying that says, I'm going to tell you two sayings and I'm going to shut up. Um, but the, the first one is actually Klaus, which they teach at military schools, uh, which is uh, that um, that ruling class in war, that ruling class which best controls their own population, ends up winning the war. And uh, and if you think about the Vietnam War, where it was a little podunk country going up against the most heavily armed military that the world had ever seen and the strongest empire that had ever been imagined uh, in the history of the world, and yet they won. And you can't help, you clearly wasn't on the basis of firepower because, you know, that wasn't it. And Clausewitz was right, you know, uh, you know, that, that, ruling class which best controls its own people wins the war and in the Vietnam War the American ruling class lost its own people you know step by step by step whereas the Vietnamese managed to continue to keep their people and of course that was easier for them because they had you know they knew exactly what was happening to them and you know um, and of course you know kill my grandma you know and you know I'm your enemy kind of thing the other thing, though, is, is to speak to the Vietnam Syndrome. Because what we used to say uh, as radical veterans, once the war was over, um, one of the things I did after, you know, when that Deer Hunter movie came out, I was one of the vets that went down to the, I can say that I've been to the Academy Awards, <clears throat> but uh, not exactly uh, because I was a movie star, um, although I was in Sir No Sir and whatever, but, uh, but the vets decided that the Deer Hunter movie was, was uh, very cleverly rewriting the verdict on the war because all those images like that famous image of of the Saigon police chief shooting the Vietnamese suspect in the head all those ones that were branded into my generation they used them in the movie but they reversed them so it was the mean Vietnamese doing it to us rather than us doing it to them very clever and very uh, kind of insidious we so we went down there to protest, and I won't get into that story because that's a whole other story for a different day. But um, but we did it because of this slogan, and the slogan says, first you fight the battle, 
and then you fight the battle of summation. Mm -hmm. Now, the way that works in unions is that, you know, you go on strike this time, and then between now and next contract, you've got, if you're the union guy, you've got to convince the, the workers that, that the strike was their finest hour and the best thing that ever happened to them, and you know, the boss has got to convince them that they lost more money than they could ever hope to make, and blah, 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 and then whoever's battle of summation wins determines how it's going to go next contract. If you think about wars, you know, our job as the veterans who, who, who said never again, you know, and God knows how many American soldiers died with never again on their lips, you know, or fuck this war as they were crumpling into the mud, you know. But, but our job as, as, the, as the veterans and as the anti-war movement was to fight the battle to end that war, but then to fight the battle of summation which is kind of where that Vietnam syndrome business came from, right? You know, it's like to have the American people sum up that the worst thing that we could have ever done was have that war. It was the dumbest, stupidest, most evil thing we could have done, you know? And let's never do that again, never again. Well, that, you know, there was a, the, the Vietnam generation, at a some point, as we started getting old, and then we're old, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we kind of took the torch and we were kind of sticking back there and we thought the next guy was going to pick it up and carry on and there was kind of nobody there for a minute. And that was a little disheartening to us. But then along comes the Iraq War. And if you talk to people nowadays about the Iraq War, and they say, well, wait a minute, there wasn't any weapons of mass destruction, there, you know, all of that other kind of stuff. And, and people sum up the Iraq War. We're still seeing the consequences of that. You know? And I think that one, if you think about first you fight the battle, then you fight the battle of summation, it's very clear to me what, uh, what our task is. You see, and, uh, and that's to fight that battle of summation so that people going forward say, gosh, they lied to us about Vietnam. It was the Gulf Tonkin incident was a lie. And that was the excuse for escalating the war. You know, they lied to us about just about everyone you can think of, but they certainly lied to us about the weapons of mass distraction and all that other stuff. And, and, uh, and you, you know, at a certain point, you know, you kind of just blow it out of the water to say, you know, how many times, how much bullshit do you have to buy before you realize that, what it is? So with that, I'll shut up. Uh, and uh, if you haven't seen Sir No Sir, I certainly encourage you to do so. Um, thank you. And we're going to change, uh, shift gears a little bit now. We've been talking about the history of protest. Uh, the next two speakers are going to be addressing current efforts to uh, protest the war. Our first member of the, uh, that group is uh, Graham Klutner. He did not send me a biography, but I can tell you what I know about it. He's a veteran of the Iraq War, I believe, and an active member of Iraq Veterans Against the War. He's also a member of the volunteer board of Coffee Strong, a pro-GI anti-war uh, resource center located adjacent to Port, uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord. Currently a student at uh, Evergreen, and you're pursuing what degree? Master's in Environmental Studies. Okay, so please welcome Graham Popper. We've heard this term GI and GI resistance throughout the whole process, and I just wanted to, to point out the word GI means government issue. So from the perspective of the U.S. military, a GI is a piece of equipment. So that's important to remember throughout this process. So when 9-11 happened, I was 17 years old, and uh, much like some of the other folks in this panel, I wanted to give back to my country. I had been raised on Black Hawk Down and Saving Private Ryan and the 50th or 60th anniversary of World War II and all these ideas about what it meant to be a man in our culture. And as an only child who has no military history in my family, um, there wasn't really a narrative one way or the other to tell me what to do with myself after 9-11. And if you remember, if you're old enough to remember what Bush said, there was two options to give back to your country. One was to join the US military, and the other was to go to Disneyland or go shopping. Uh, go shopping. So, I was never too much on the shopping part, um, and I liked the outdoors, and I thought I would like to shoot a gun, so I enlisted in the U.S. Army. And it was so popular at that time that I had to wait a year just to be able to go to training. And once I attended training, um, you know, I began to start wondering, like, uh, there was so much internal abuse towards each other and turning us against each other in the training process uh, that I began to maybe not question the wars themselves. By this point, this is 2003, and we had just invaded Iraq. Uh, we had been in Afghanistan for almost two years. And 
I was just I, I was questioning whether or not the effectiveness of the of our approach was working, um, and I definitely had questions about how we were um, approaching Iraq. It didn't seem very strategic for me. It wasn't about the people. It wasn't some humanitarian perspective. It seemed kind of stupid to attack people that, to me, clearly had nothing to do with 9/11. If you ever read a single book, you would understand that. Um, and the American people uh, trusted, a lot of us trusted our leaders, the adults, the people at the wheel, uh, to show us the right way. And even though 10 million people marched in the streets on February 18th, 2003, all across the world, largest world gathering in human history against the war, uh, including San Francisco shutting its city down completely, Places like Olympia and Seattle and Madison and Denver and Oakland, just, you know, tons of resistance. Despite that, it didn't get news coverage. It didn't allow us practical alternatives to war. So when we finally got in a discussion about like, okay, so Saddam is a bad person. Bin Laden's a bad person. We need to get these people, these terrorists. Uh, the left in our country didn't have an alternative. It was like, no war. And it's... Interesting because it's the same thing we've been struggling with when it comes to climate change, you know, like no more fossil fuels, no more. And we don't have these alternatives of like what the other road is. And so in a lot of ways we get dismissed. So uh, I wanted to just tell a little bit about my experience leaving the military and then kind of sum up a few <clears throat> ideas about resistance. Um, I'd always looked at veterans as like this... I mean, had I met any of the folks on this panel that are vets prior to my service, I would have like stopped my car, gotten out, went over, shook your hand, and thank you for your service. And now, when someone does that to me, <laughs> the exact opposite response. Um, so in 2005, I deployed to Afghanistan. And at that point, Afghanistan was, a, uh, was the good war. It was supposedly the calm war. And we had already won that war, and it was just a process of us, like, mopping up and cleaning up. I was part of an uh, army unit uh, called the 75th Ranger Regiment. I was stationed at Fort Lewis, and my job was to jump out of airplanes at the beginning of a war and take over the airfields. If you take the airfields, then you can fly your own planes in, bring tanks, extra equipment, and food. Um, after you do that, you can't keep taking the airfields, right? So once you own the airfields, you got to switch your mission. And our mission then switched to snatch and grab or direct action missions. Um, so essentially imagine a SWAT team in the United States, but overseas. And imagine that SWAT team not speaking the language. Imagine that SWAT team not understanding the culture. Imagine that SWAT team never having been on that block, never operated in that city before, and going into people's houses at three in the morning, because that is when scientists and psychologists that the U.S. military hired tell us that's when people are most vulnerable. That's when you're most groggy. That's when you're least likely to respond and resist to a home invasion. Um, so we would take people out of their beds based on intelligence, intelligence uh, that had been passed on to us. Sometimes it was uh, electronic intercepts, like phone calls. Uh, sometimes it was personal conversations. But most of the time, it was people settling scores and using the U.S. military to settle them for them. So you had opposite tribes or people who had some feud going back a long time, and they'd call up the Americans and say, hey, Al-Qaeda's over in that house over there. And we'd be like, let's go get them. So a lot of the times, we would roll up the wrong people. And when we did have an accurate address, a lot of the times, people weren't at the house. So I was part of a unit that in our folklore of American history is considered to be one of the most efficient, uh, one of the most well-funded and historically significant units. And yet we were unable to perform our jobs to the extent that the United States movie industry had informed me that we did. Um, how many of y'all have seen American Sniper? Anybody in this room seen American Sniper? That is a fucked up movie. Um, but those types of memes, those types of narratives in our culture uh, create this idea of even in losing battles that uh, the American soldier is an honorable uh, person who is trying to do the right thing despite the politicians or despite the circumstance, the political circumstances. Um, and what I found in my experience was this devolution of our souls. So uh, some people talk about training 
in the U.S. military as a dehumanization process. And that is true to the extent that they dehumanize us as Americans. But to the extent that Afghans or Iraqis or Vietnamese or Somalis or Yemenis or Pakistanis or Syrians, to list all the countries we have or currently are bombing, it requires someone to be human in the first place to be dehumanized. And we don't consider those people human to begin with. So it was a very easy step to go to the point of calling people ragheads and camel jockeys and sand niggers and goat ropers. It was a very easy process to look at a silhouette of a black human being and point and shoot at those targets over and over and over. Muscle memory creating a lack of thought. To take those neurons and skip one of them and go straight from like reaction to action. And it wasn't until years after the military, after 2007 when I left, that I started really processing because it's survival. You're trying to go through the motions. You have a million tasks to do every day, um, but yet you're bored as hell. And the last thing you want to do is think about the experience that you're having. So when my time came up after four years, I knew that I was done with the US military. And so I left. I didn't know what to do with my life. And somehow my parents convinced me to stumble into college, ass backwards and drunk. <laughs> I was waking up every morning, putting whiskey in my coffee, and uh, basically letting my day progress downward from there. And I was rescued about a year and a half out of the military in a very unique way. My father, right after the election of our anti-war president, Barack Obama, uh, my father received a letter in the mail on November 11th, which is Veterans Day, that I was being recalled to active duty service for a year and a half deployment to Iraq. And he was crying. And that is not something that my father has ever done before. And so I was thrust into this position of having to not only make a moral choice about my direction in my life and actually relive and refocus on the, the behaviors that I've already participated in, but also to take care of my family in a way, the emotional burden of like carrying my friends and family. And during that process, I had worked up until that point, I had worked for the Obama campaign and I had participated in democratic politics. And I learned something really unique when I got recalled to the US military. And that was the party members, and not all of them of course, but the party members that I had worked with, when I went to them, when I went to congressmen and senators that I'd worked for in Wisconsin and said, here's the situation, I need your help, they're trying to send me back to Iraq, to a T, they told me that I had signed a piece of paper and that it was my obligation to go back there. And these are the same motherfuckers that signed that war so they could, go, they could send not their kids over there, but other people's kids. So that was a major break for me when that support didn't exist among the people supposedly it was supposed to. And I began to like ask questions. I began to discover Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky. I began to, to reach out in a different way. And I made a decision no matter what, whether I went to jail, whether I went to Canada, whether whatever, I was not going back. And that led to the political process that has me sitting here today. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting. I think there's a, I, I, I noticed how many young men there are in the room. And I think that's interesting because usually political events, I find much more young women than I find young men. And I also find a lot of women between 50 and 75. If you were, how many of the young men here are students, right? Now? Okay, so if this is 1967, 1968, the t your teachers are a large determinant of whether or not you get drafted. If you fail out of college right now, you fail one of your classes, you get drafted. You're on the first ticket over to Vietnam. That does not exist for this generation. Because after Vietnam, the US military took a look at itself and said, we had 600 thousand American soldiers go to Canada, go to jail, refuse, frag their officers and say, we're not participating in this. And the military made a determination thinking that was because of the draft, that that was because people were connected in their communities. And so the military shifted to an all volunteer military. Oh no, so, a lot of people stood down at, in Olympia, all over the United States stood in silent vigil against the draft. That's very significant. My right. mother, my mother stood in silent vigil. There was, yeah, there was absolute resistance to that, and the military's tactical shift 
to overcome that in 1976 was to switch to an all-volunteer military. And they added all these kinds of benefits. So for example, if you have a child in the military now, you get full health benefits. If you're serving in the military and your spouse or your children want to go to college, they can go to college for free. If you have a kid in the military, you are staying in the military because there's no other way you're going to walk out and find those kinds of social structures. If you are a working class person in America, you can immediately become middle class by joining the U.S. military. So they made these shifts that, that, that forced a certain segment, a working class segment of the American population to have like little to no alternatives when they join, when they, when they graduate high school. Like, do I want to go into college? I sucked in high school. I struggled. I hated it. Or, you know, I can go into the military and actually get some money for student loans or, you know, get things paid off. Um, so the circumstances of like GI resistance today versus during Vietnam is very, very different because a lot of the time when I talk to civilians and folks in the United States, people say things like, well, you enlisted. Why should I feel sorry for you? Why should I support your resistance if you chose to be in that situation? And I would point out one of the interesting things about the Vietnam War is that the initial GI resistance started from enlistees, people who had volunteered for the military, who felt betrayed by their government. And there is an interesting thing about betrayal that's a key part of trauma. So trauma comes when betrayal exists. Trauma is something that all of us in this culture are facing. You know, Peter talked about capitalism before. There's been trauma long before capitalism existed, but it finds a really fascinating way to specialize it, and it becomes intergenerational. So we hear these things like the World War II vets came home and they just got back to work, right? They got back down to it and built America. Yeah, they also came home and beat their wives and beat their kids. They also created the institutions that sent us to Korea, and sent us to Vietnam, and sent us to Iraq, and sent us to Afghanistan. How many people in here know a veteran? I mean, being associated with, with those wars overseas, when those folks come home, they bring that trauma with them. And so a lot of the work that I've been trying to do is recruit, unionize, educate active duty soldiers and personnel and veterans when they come back and help them take responsibility for their own trauma, for their own, for their own experiences, and try to help Try to help. <laughs> try to try to help change the process because our goal is to create a world where there are no veterans. Yes. Like we're trying to abolish ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of work that's happening in this region right now um, around connecting climate change and militarism because, as the military tells us, all future wars are climate wars. And if we want to understand how we're going to build a world that holds up all of the values that I know the folks in this room have, we have to be part of the peace movement first and foremost. Because these, mil these, these militaristic policies are what prevent us from actually addressing social inequality. So I look forward to talking more afterwards, but there's, uh, there's a lot of campaigns going on right now that folks in this room can participate in. And I look forward to hearing what work you all are doing so we can actually come together and start connecting more. Thanks very much. to their future.